Well, it's our first morning here at Witmos Cliff. Well, I say our, but our I mean yours and mine. <laughs> it's a bit of a solo hunt for me uh, due to the whole COVID-19 thing. I'm the only person out of a normal group who could get a permit um, because it's my work to film and shoot stuff, <laughs> which is great. But um, yeah, it should be good nonetheless. I'm hoping to get some cool footage for you guys. I'm up here on a, on a hill. I came up here just before sunrise just to get a, a beautiful view of everything. It's, it's so nice to be outside again. And I'm hearing doves everywhere. So I think that uh, our first job today might be to see if we can shoot maybe just two or three doves and get some meat for the barbecue tonight. And then after that, we'll do the normal drive around and, and see if we can get some monkeys, uh, especially with the air guns. I'd like to get some stuff done with the air guns, maybe shoot a baboon or two, a few warthogs maybe and uh, a zebra possibly i know it sounds crazy but um anton the farmer's son has been asked to shoot a zebra on the farm next door that should be interesting but let's get down let's make some coffee and some breakfast and see where the day takes us on my way back down to the camp i get an opportunity to film a laughing dove if you listen carefully here you can hear its call and this my friends is the sound of dinner inviting you to go out and harvest it <laughs> The previous day I'd managed to bag a few doves for dinner, it wasn't something that I planned, it just kind of happened, but today I wanted to put a bit more effort into filming a hunt so that you can see exactly what an air gun hunt for completely wild doves looks like. And that is precisely what I do, the old faithful FX impact comes out, I find a suitable branch to lean against and I get an opportunity to go two for one early on. Well, there you go. I think that's two doves down. I saw the one drop right there. Other one looked like it flew a bit, which is strange because that's the one I was aiming for. But let's go take a look, shall we? Well, the sun was just starting to come up there. I was having a nice cup of coffee, enjoying being outside. And then I heard two doves at a bit of a distance away. I was lining up on them, they flew over to one of these trees here, like 20 meters away, right here in the camp, and sat up there, and I lined up on both of them, try to get a double head shot. So I think this is the one at the back, I think I missed the first one, but yeah, it looks like I skimmed the wing there and then went straight into the front of the chest. So yep, that's one down, and let's just see if the other one was hit. Oh yeah, here he is. So I did get both. Let's see where I hit this one. Oh yeah, his head is basically gone. So that's two doves. Now these are quite small. You see there's my hand. Small birds, but they're very tasty. So these will be eaten tonight. I think let's quickly de-breast them right now so we don't have to do it later. And maybe see if we can get one or two more. Well, getting one or two more is much easier said than done. You can be fooled into thinking it will be an easy task based on the sheer number of bird calls heard all around, but these are wild birds that have had to fend off predators all the time. They aren't used to people like the doves in the cities, and it turns out to be quite a challenge. The best strategy out here seems to be to listen to their calls, walk towards the sound, and try to get a shot off once you see them, but my little walkabout yields nothing as I just can't find any doves. I do however see a hoopoe which is worth filming, it's a classic South African bird. One thing you'll notice out here is that the grass is too long to be taking prone shots and there aren't really many trees or rocks to support the rifle on. And this is where it helps to have some experience with disciplines like PRS, NRL, field target or three position shooting. I've no experience with field target, but I used to shoot three position competitively and have decent experience with NRL, so a seated shot like this is something I'm pretty comfortable with. Unfortunately, the dove I was aiming for spooked oh. and flew off, which was quite frustrating, but he lands in a different tree and I'm able to set up for a shot. 
Oh, is he gone? Just flew down there. All right, well, let's guess a range. I'm gonna say 70. Maybe a bit more. Yeah, 70. Let's try 70. Where'd you go? There you are. Oh my word. Please tell me that was recording. Yes. <laughs> okay, so long story short, I was shooting at some starlings. Starlings disappeared after I shot one of them. Dove landed in a tree about 20 meters away, but spooked when I when I was preparing to take a shot and flew some distance off. Okay. Now, landed in the tree there, I guessed it to be about 70 meters and dialed for 70, which is what? Less than one mil. I think it's like nine clicks, 0.9 mil. Now, let's put this in perspective. If you were shooting any other pellet gun, whether it's 30 cal, 25, 22, at 70 meters, you're most likely to be holding close to two mil with the same zero. You have, you have a lot more room for error when it comes to shooting slags, especially at high speeds. You're shooting slags at high speeds. If you get your range wrong by 10 meters even at this range, you're probably still gonna hit the dove, which is insane. It's mind blowing. But I absolutely muddled that one, um, resting on a, on a stick like this. One lesson you will have learned here is that it's important to practice shooting from different positions. You can't just shoot off a bench. You can't just shoot lying prone. You've got to practice sitting. You've got to practice resting your gun on something. You gotta practice keeping your point of balance more or less the same each time so that your recoil is the same. Otherwise, you're gonna have point of impact shifts. So a lot of things you can learn. So um, I'm very happy. I think, I'm, I think we're gonna stop there with three doves. There's a lot more shooting to do on this farm. I don't wanna hang around here too much, but let's go fetch that one and let's uh, debreast those three birds and, and call, it, uh, call it an end to the dove hunt. But still more to, to do, so stay tuned. Okay, I should think this one should be fairly easy to find. Just sitting up here, should be directly below. There you go. Pretty easy now. This could have been a Cape Turtle Dove. And no, I think it's a Laughing Dove. They're quite similar, the similar size. Cape Turtle Dove has a more white neck and head area. Laughing Dove is, is more of a brown on its back. But this one was middled, I think right there in the chest and oof, blew a big hole out of his back. I'm not gonna zoom in too much on that, but really happy with that. Third Dove down, I think that's the perfect amount for a, a dinner for one. <laughs> Debreasting Doves is a pretty quick and easy process. Once you know what you're doing, it can get a little bit messy, but I'll show you quickly how it's done, you basically, <laughs> get your arms ready for a bit of feathers you're going to want to pluck a few of the feathers off the breast just a few don't need to expose the whole bird but you want to expose the the keel bone in the front you're going to take your knife and just make a little bit of an incision on the skin the outer layer of skin and you're then going to just grab the skin and peel it out on all sides to expose the, the breast meat. But there's your meat and basically now what you're gonna do is you're gonna cut all the way down along the side here. There's like a point at which the, the breast meat disappears and becomes organs at the back. You don't want the organs, you only want the meat. This is where it can get a bit messy and that's why you wanna remove some of that skin on the outside just so you can see what you're doing. But if you follow that breast bone all the way around it should be pretty easy and thankfully these first two birds that were shot in the head there's absolutely no meat damage whatsoever 
As for the third bird, well, <laughs> we'll have to see about that. It's our second breast out. They're pretty small, I'll be honest with you. But aside from the breast meat, there's actually not much else on the bird. There's nothing on the legs, there's nothing anywhere else. So once you've got the breast out, you can chuck the rest away. It'll be food for the jackals and stuff like that, the, the crows. And I'm gonna do the rest. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bore you with this, but we've got meat for dinner, that's awesome. While I was planning to spend the day shooting monkeys and ground squirrels, but plans changed quickly as I'm called to hop on the farmer's truck for a spontaneous adventure on the neighbor's farm. You're really gonna enjoy this one. I've been invited to come and shoot a blessed buck on the neighbor's farm for a birthday present. It was my birthday last week. So we're gonna go and shoot a zebra and we're going quite early in the morning before it gets too hot and the meat can get spoiled. And yeah, we hope the best and hope we can get one. We drive for probably 45 minutes onto the neighbor's farm, which happens to be a very popular hunting destination. And as Anton mentioned, we have a specific plan in mind for today. We are after a zebra. Waterfall Game and Hunting Safaris is a typical Eastern Cape farm with rolling hills, green cliffs, grassy hilltops, and an abundance of game. I didn't get a chance to film all the game I would have liked to, but we did see some springbuck on the way up and one or two mountain reedbuck. This property even has a very nice wedding venue for anyone who wants to spend their special day surrounded by a wild open space. It isn't long before we see our first zebra, in fact it was one of the first species we saw when we drove into the property. However, we didn't want to just shoot the first one we saw, we wanted to first survey the situation and see what else was on offer. We headed up a mountain road and eventually found a larger herd grazing in the hills and this is where I want to explain the whole reason for today's hunt. You see, zebras aren't just beautiful, stripy, plush toys. They are large animals that eat a lot. What this means is that they have to be managed. In this clip, you can see clearly how the zebras have overgrazed certain areas, exposing the red soil underneath. And it's because of this overgrazing that the landowners decided that the herd needs to be managed. With COVID-19 causing chaos with travel bans, there are no international hunters flying in to hunt these animals. And so the opportunity has been given to Anton for his birthday, lucky boy. But I'm about to get a surprise of my own as we climb further up the mountain. We begin to spot a few warthogs and I'm told that I should shoot one if I get an opportunity. Of course, I'm not turning that offer down and this happens very quickly. So forgive the lack of context, but my 300 WSM make short work of this pig as soon as he gives me an opportunity. Well, we're on our way to look for a, a zebra for Anton, um, but the warthogs can be a problem on these farms. They break fences and they also just, you know, tear up vegetation. So the idea is that you should take some shots of them every now and again to, to get them down. Um, these ones will be going to uh, guys in the, in the local towns who, who don't have enough food, um, especially now during the, the lockdown, there's a lot of people without jobs. So any meat that we can donate to them is uh, much appreciated. It's the first uh, shot I've ever taken an animal with my, my new 300. Uh, first shot ever taken on a larger animal with an element scope. So really happy about that. I uh, just want to thank Anton and obviously Wenzel, um, whose property this is. Um, I'll put a link down below to his uh, hunting outfit if you want to check it out but yeah awesome to be up here and what a beautiful view behind us as well so great way to start the morning but we want to get that zebra down as well let's do it this may seem pretty straightforward but it really isn't we know that the zebras won't let us get anywhere near them so we begin to put a strategy in place we decide that instead of chasing them around the mountains all day it may be best to set up in one spot and wait for an opportunity to come our way with the hillside that the zebras seem to like, sitting directly above us, Anton and I look for a good spot to set up in a prone position that gives us a view of the whole hill and allows Anton to get comfortable enough to take a long shot if need be. Another very important consideration is that we can't shoot the zebra too far up the mountain or else recovery will be near impossible. So we're going to have to choose our spot very carefully. And that's where I come in. 
Matt Dubber, the spotter slash cameraman slash technical support. <laughs> I'm anticipating that we may have to shoot from a fair distance, so I've taken up the responsibility of measuring all the conditions and setting up the Kestrel and the rangefinder so that when the time comes, I can quickly range, dial, and give Anton the green light. And now we wait. We've got a good spot here, good position. So it's just a matter of waiting. We know the zebra like to come into this valley. So instead of trying to walk around, trying to find them, we're just going to wait here. That way we've got time to set up and read the wind and all of that. So I guess you could call it an ambush. And we're ready. It turns out to be a pretty long and frustrating wait. The zebras are full of energy today. And although a few different herds come past us, none of them present us with any safe shots. At one point we move position and set up in front of a different hill, but ultimately decide that the first spot was better and have to trek back. Frustratingly, one of the only chances we get is on a mother with a foal, but decide against it just in case the foal isn't old enough to fend for itself yet. Fast forward a couple hours, another group comes through and once again, it looks like it's going to keep moving. But just as we're about to give up and call it a day, they begin to slow down and we get an opportunity on a big stallion. I range quickly, dial the scope and give Anton the green light and the rest is up to him. Hit him, yep. I'm staying on him, good shot. See him bleeding. Gonna go down. I can see that the shot is great right in the engine room, but a zebra is like a Toyota. It's not easy to stop that engine from running, and it's a good 30 seconds or so before he eventually runs out of steam and topples over. Yeah, yeah that was a perfect shot, great shot. I'm happy with my shot, and I just need to keep my spot where the zebra fell to not lose it. And yeah, it's quite a big one, it's a perfect shot, so I'm happy with everything there. Well, that's only half the job done. Anton put in a perfect shot, but we now have to get the whole animal back. This is not like hunting in like parts of North America and New Zealand and stuff where you can, you know, you just take your trophy and the back straps and you, you head home. We take everything here. And so that's why we, partly why we took so long because you got to get the animal close enough to an accessible road where you can get guys to carry it from its position to the road. So, that's what made it tricky. We couldn't shoot it right on top of the ridge. It would just be too much work to get it back. But it's still going to be a, a difficult job. We're 440 meters above the road. So hard work is about to start. From the top, you can see just how far the shot was. Anton was lying right here on the side of the road. Pretty impressive for someone who's pulling the trigger on this rifle for the very first time. Okay, so I just want to thank the farmer a lot for this, uh, allowing me to shoot the zebra. The meat will be donated to the orphanage and everything so it won't go to waste. And I'm going to make a nice carpet to the skin. Long day, it was hot in the sun, but patience paid off. We got our zebra, so yeah. I'm also happy with my shot placement, perfectly behind the shoulder. Zebras are very tough, they can run for miles with a shot in them. Luckily my shot pla placement was perfect and we tried to shoot the zebra because they were just overgrazing the camp. They are eating all the grass and it was just getting too much. So yeah, that's where we shot it. And I just want to also thank everyone that helped and Matt for being so patient and my dad and my sister for helping. And of course, the day certainly doesn't end here. The animal is gutted out in the felt to reduce its weight a bit before reinforcements are radioed in to help with the long haul down. Now you understand why we wanted to be careful where we took the shot. You do not want to be carrying late into the night if you can help it. been a great day out in the mountains. I'll put a link to Vaterfall Safaris in the video description. If you want an authentic Eastern Cape hunting experience, you can check them out.
Well, for dinner tonight, we have the dove breasts from the birds I shot this morning. But I had some time and I was feeling very hungry after <laughs> skipping breakfast and lunch. So I put a bit more effort into it and I put some olive oil and some herbs and some spices and stuff on the breasts. And then I wrapped them in bacon, put a toothpick through them. And basically what that does is it just locks the moisture inside. Um, the meat itself on, on dove is great, but there's no fat on it, which means that the meat can get quite dry. It's great in a pie because a pie locks the moisture in as well. But if, you, if you're not going to do a pie, if you want to just cook over an open fire, this is a great way to do it. So that should be really good. Uh, plus the bacon just makes a little bit more filling. And then to add to that, I've got some lamb chops as well from a lamb that was slaughtered just earlier this week, actually. So yeah, it's a great way to support the local farmers and to just end off an awesome day of hunting. I'm really happy with the, the day's events and I can't wait to share them with you. Right, so moment of truth. We've got these guys. Let's see how they taste. Mm. Now the key with dove and pigeon is you don't want to overcook it. Um, it's best done like medium rare. You don't want to overcook it because that just makes it almost livery, like it almost crumbles apart. This is perfect. I didn't overcook it, and I think the bacon just kind of kept all the moisture in and I added with rosemary and thyme. That seemed to definitely help a lot, and the brine in the bacon gives it a bit of a salty taste. So, awesome combination. This is a fantastic starter. Next up, we have our main course. As always, thanks for watching this Oxywagon Diaries episode and do consider subscribing if you haven't already done so because the next few episodes are going to be insane. Keep well and I'll see you next time.